We have been in a series, and our series is entitled Closer, and we have called it Closer because we believe that being a Christian is all about a relationship, a relationship between you and God, me and God, and it's so wonderful to have that relationship, and we want to be closer. It is not a religion, it is not a ritual, it is a relationship, an exciting relationship, knowing God. And he wants a relationship with you more than Pastor Carl could explain to you today. He told us to call him Father. What a relationship. It is a love relationship. He wants a close relationship with you. And so we've sort of focused on what could we do to, to, to be closer to God in our relationship. And we had five tens, and we looked at one each, each week. And, and so the last one is tithing. And and you say, Pastor, are you going to talk about money again today? I am. You came on a day, you know, and you're saying, man, I braved the weather, and he's going to... We're in a new series starting next Sunday, a new series on the stories Jesus told. You're going to love it, because Jesus told... He was the master storyteller. The greatest storyteller that ever lived was our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at just some hi highlights, some of them. And we'll have so much fun, it'll take us right up to Easter. But true riches, what are true riches? Um, you know, in his book, Paradise Lost, this classic book written by John Milton, he talks about the fallen commander-in-chief, Satan. And then he talks about some of his, his generals, his demon generals, uh, they were Magog, they were Belial, Moloch. These are gods that you read about in the Old Testament. They turned the hearts of people away from worshiping the true God to worshiping idols. And then he tells about one more, though, and in, those, in these, these demon generals that Satan had in Paradise Lost. And that one more was... Um, mammon. Jesus spoke of mammon in the New Testament. So the others were Old Testament. This was a New Testament general, mammon. And uh, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, that it is impossible to serve two masters. We'll hate one and love the other. Loyal to one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. It is possible to not serve God, but instead to serve mammon. In fact, I'm fearful in my heart that many, many of God's people are not serving God. They are serving mammon. Mammon is first in their life, and whatever's first in your life is what drives your life. That is the most important thing. God said you can't serve both. Mammon wants to rule you. He wants you to serve him. He is seeking worshipers. He promises security, freedom, power, identity. All the things that only God can give lasting. He may give them to you for a time, but in a lasting way, only God can give. Mammon says, take. God says, give. Mammon says, it's about self. It's about you. you. If you don't look out for yourself, nobody else is going to. God says, it's about others. Mammon says, selfishness. God says, generosity. I know it's against grain to the teaching of our world today. And, and all week long, we're just bombarded by it. I mean, you watch, you watch a ball game on TV, and at, at commercial time, they show you, a, you got to have this to be happy. You, boy, if I just had that kind of car, if I, had, I would be so happy. And, uh, and I'm not saying that things can't bring us some happiness. The Bible talks about God gives us all things to enjoy, and there are joys in the things of life. I'm not preaching against having certain things, but 
It is what we have first in our life is what God is talking about. Mammon is the Aramaic word for riches or wealth. Jesus said you can't serve both. You can't serve both. Well, is money inherently evil? No, it's not. Money is not inherently evil. In fact, money is neutral. But it does compete with my heart, with God. It competes for your heart, for your affection that God wants. God wants your heart in his relationship with you. He wants your affections. And money competes for that. People say, well, I know. The Bible says the money is the root Money is the root of all evil. That's really not what it says. In 1 Timothy, it says the love of money, the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And it's what I put my heart on. It's what I set my attention to, uh, my affections. God said, this is what he's warning us about, the love of money. Money itself is not inherently evil. It can be blessed. Uh, a little boy brought his lunch to Jesus. Jesus blessed it and multiplied it. And it was a blessing to many. Two weeks ago, we saw Elijah said to the widow who was going to eat her last meal with her son and die because they were in a famine. She said, this is all we have. He said, make me a cake first. What? And she did what she put him first. And God blessed and multiplied her flour and oil. And it never ran out through the whole famine. Money is not intrinsically evil. It can be blessed and multiplied. But whatever is first in my life will drive my life. Seek first the kingdom our Bible says, and all these other things, things that we seek, all these other things will be added to you. I don't know about you, I like being first. Do you like to be first? I like to be first. I do. I, uh, I ran my first race when I was 55 years old, first marathon when I was 55. I, had, I was reading a book about marathoning. And I got halfway through it. I said, I'm going to do that before I die. So I signed up for a marathon. Didn't know what I was doing at all. And didn't know what I was getting into. And, and, and I ran my first race. And now, 17 years later, I, I have run 50 races. And uh, I log all my races. I write a little story about each one. I, I keep the record. I, I log all my training miles. I can tell you how many miles I ran this week. And I, I, I log it all. And I've run over 18,000 miles that I've logged. <laughs> That's incredible, isn't it? And uh, 50 races, 27 of them marathons, four of them Boston. You know how many I've won? Goose egg. I've often wondered, what would it be like to be the guy that crosses the finish line first to break the tape? I never had that experience. I never will <laughs> at my age. You know, never will. And now, a few times I've finished first in my age. That's getting easier all the time. <laughs> and uh, in fact, uh, several times I have. I finished third in the Lincoln half a few years ago, missed second by a few seconds. And I did the half in a, an hour 50-something. I thought that was pretty good. Well, then, two years ago, my wife and I went to Utah, and we hiked some canyons at, and Bryce Canyon, one of the most beautiful spots in the world. And I ran the half marathon at Bryce Canyon. And it all came, sometimes it all comes together. It all came together for me that day. And I ran it in an hour 47 minutes, which is about eight minutes, just 
just a tad over eight minutes a mile. I mean, for a guy, you know, pushing 70, that, that's pretty. And we went to the award part afterwards, and I, they called up the third guy in my age bracket, and I looked at his time, and I said, I must be at least second. They called up the second guy, and I said, I looked at Gail and said, oh, my. Because I had it figured out. Then, then they called my name, and I walked up, and I got the first I got the trophy for first place, and I liked it. <laughs> I stood up there for a little bit, looked out, I said, I like this. I like finishing first. This is exciting. This is as, this is as good as it gets. And so I was going to go back the next year. Instead, I had an injury. A hamstring went bad on me, and I, and I had to miss four months of running. I had never missed that long. And I had to go to physical therapy, and I tried to get back to eight-minute mile. Couldn't get back. And so this year, I went back. And my wife wasn't able to go because her mother was in the hospital, so I went by my lonesome. And I hiked several canyons, had so much fun. Eight days. I liked to camp. I camped. And the last day, I did Bryce Canyon half again. Same race. I said, I'm going to get first. I'm going to get first again. They called third place. He went up and my name was called second. I got second place. Then they called first. I didn't like that guy at all. <laughs> and I had a 17 mile drive home, 17 hour drive uh, home from Utah. All the way home, I was beating myself over the head. Carl, you could have done better than that. You came in second. You, you know how much fun it is to come in first. I hate to be second, don't you? I want to be first. I just want to tell you something. My God will never settle for second in my life. He will never. If you don't remember, th remember this. There's certain things God cannot do. Did you know that God can't change? <laughs> He's perfect. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today. He can't change. Uh, uh, God can't, uh, God has perfect knowledge. He can't all of a sudden learn something. You know I mean, he, he never has to say, uh-oh, and figure something out like you and me. Nothing ever dawns on God. You know? <laughs> he know. I don't understand that. Here's another thing about God. God cannot be second. Theologians call it the preeminence of God. He is first. He was first before anything else. <laughs> he is first. Always will be first. He is God. He is God. And he knows the only way you will ever truly be happy and fulfilled in life is to let him be God in your life. To make him first. And as long as I have something before him, I will never be happy. I never will. I, I mean, I'm not, I will have taste of happiness. I, I will have temporary ha I may have some, I might find some joy in this or that, but it will, I mean, full fulfillment, real joy. I mean, Jesus said, I came that you might have life and you might have it abundantly. The only way is when he's first. That's it. Now, I don't know if he I mean, I'm made in the image of God. I like to be first. <laughs> but he must be first. He must be first. He must be. And so, it is the heart that he wants. He wants to be first in my heart, in your heart. And so, it is, it is not your money he wants. It is your heart. I know that. And, 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 and so... He says, it is the love of money that is the root of all sorts of evil. When we set our heart on, and the greatest competition God has for my heart is money, is mammon, it is wealth. And, and, and so, is there an antidote to this problem? There is. And it is the tithe. Leviticus 27, look at this. Thus all the tithe is the Lord's. 
It is sacred. It is holy. The word holy means set apart. Set apart. Sanctified. It is holy. It is God's. God said the first 10% that I, I give you all that you have. But the first 10%, he said, you give back to me. It's my way of having you show me that I'm first in your life. The first 10%. It is an eternal principle from an eternal God. It is pictured even in the Bible. When, when, when Joshua took the children of Israel into the promised land, the first city they conquered out of 10 major cities was Jericho. God said, none of the spoils of the battle you can have. Don't touch it. Every other city, they could have the spoils of the battle, not Jericho, because it was the first city. The tithe is the Lord's. It is taught. It is, it is uh, pictured. Uh, it is illustrated. Uh, the tithe, is. this is God's way of helping me put him first in my life. In Deuteronomy, God mentions it again. You shall surely tithe. The tithe of your grain, your wine, your oil, firstborn of your herd, your flock. Why, God? Here it is. So that you may learn to fear, to reverence the Lord your God always. Fear there is not run and hide fear. It is reverence fear. God says, I want you to do this because through this, you will learn. You will learn. Tithing teaches me to reverence God. To reverence God. To put him first. Tithing is one way God teaches us. In fact, in Deuteronomy 14, he's talking to his people about this. And a few verses down from this passage there in 14, 28, uh, and, and, and 14, uh, 22. Then in verse 28, he says this, you shall bring all the tithe. Why, God? Here it is. In order that the Lord your God may bless you. God said, I can bless you if you put me first. I can give you a blessing. What is that blessing? It means I will never get sick. The car will never break down. We will never have a problem. No. No, God didn't say that. We still live in a difficult world, and there are things. Uh, we still get many inches of snow, and we have problems. <laughs> and that's part of our world. Uh, well, what is this blessing? Well, I think it goes back, first of all, to what we started to talk about, our relationship with God. You will have an exciting relationship with God. You will get to know him in a way that it is the beginning of. And you will begin to see him even multiply. What, and when you make that gift, you begin to see him use it in the lives of people. And it's the fulfillment and the joy in your heart and in your life. And then a few verses down. I think we have a little indication. Look at this. A few verses down, Deuteronomy for the Lord your God will bless you. How, God? The Lord will bless you as he has promised. And you will lend to many nations, but you will not borrow. God is talking to his people, the nation of Israel. And he said, here's how I'm going to bless you. You will be debt free. You will be debt free. Oh, my I, and I think it, it belongs not only to a nation, it belongs to families and to individuals. And we already saw in our last couple Sundays that 38% of the people in America today owe at least 16000 on their credit cards. And they are paying 12% interest on that. So about 4 out of 10. And then 75% people of the people... Uh, have no budget, have no savings, and do not give. That's sad. That's incredibly sad. And that's why Jesus talks so much about this important subject. 
in our lives because it, it can occupy us. And we've become a slave. The Bible says the borrower is slave to the lender, Proverbs says. That's why 16 of Jesus' 38 stories were about money. Because he knew what it does to our heart and to our lives. It is the number one cause of divorce in America. It puts stress on, I mean, the devil's using this to destroy and divide families. and It's incredible. Because we've set our heart on the wrong thing. And we put the wrong thing first in our lives. But God said you can be debt free. Our nation today is 22 trillion in debt. Three billion a day we're going into debt. Unbelievable. <laughs> it's staggering to think about. Because we have forgotten God. And we haven't put him first. And so therefore, we're not debt free. By the way, our church is debt free. And I'm teaching you to give. Yeah, we have a budget to meet. We do. And, 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 but I want to tell you something. I'm teaching you to give for you. Not because we got a building payment we got to make and we're up a tight, you know. That's not it. That's, uh, we, I want what's best for you. I, I want, and, 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 and I, I would love for you to take Dr. Brad's financial peace class and learn how to be debt free. It, it, it's a life changing class. But uh, God said, this is one of his blessings, that I will give you wisdom to use the 90% so well that you will become debt-free, he said. And why does God want us to be debt-free? So we can just sit back and put our feet up and have a better whatever. Is that it? No, look at this next passage in Deuteronomy you shall not harden your heart nor close your hand from your poor brother. You shall generously give to him, and your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him. <laughs> I like that little line, don't you? Have you ever given and then kind of said, why did I give that much? I could have used that. <laughs> God said, no, don't let your heart be grieved when you give. Why? Why? Because for this thing, the Lord your God will bless you when you give. He's going to bless you. Give. Why does God want us to be good managers, to be debt-free, to put him first? Why? So we can have a way better life. Well, that's, but so we can also help others. Isn't that something? God, the next thing he says, I want you to help others. I want you to help others. People who are legitimately poor, not those who won't work, but those who, there are people who've gone through certain things and, and setbacks and, and, and they need help. And, and so God says, in fact, in 2 Corinthians 9, look at this. You will be enriched, God says, when you give in everything. What for? For all liberality. God said, I'm going to enrich you so you can be more liberal with your giving. And so we become vessels and we receive from God, and we give. We receive, and we give. We become vessels for God. I know that we hear a lot today about socialism. And I think maybe some people have some, maybe some good motives when they are promoting socialism today because they're concerned maybe that some people are, need some help. Uh, and we have, it, it really comes from this zero-sum philosophy. It's a zero-sum philosophy. And that is this, that wealth cannot be created, only distributed. Wealth can only be distributed. It's as if, let's say that uh, I'm over at your house and there's eight of us there. And there's a pie, and it's cut into eight pieces. That means if I get two pieces, somebody else doesn't get one. And that's not good. Um, in other words, there's only so much wealth 
And, uh, and so if you have too much, that's, that's not good. I don't see that in the Bible, by the way. Abraham was wealthy. Barnabas was wealthy. God didn't condemn people because they were wealthy. Uh, Karl Marx divided people into two kinds of people, the oppressors and the oppressed. And, but unlike a pie that only has a limited amount, wealth is not that way. The Bible says that wealth is not limited, but it can be created. Look at this in Deuteronomy 8. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who has given you power to make wealth. Wealth can be, the word make there is created. To create wealth. God said, there's not a limited amount. And so we have capitalism versus socialism to some extent. Capitalism is a free market economic system that operates without external control. And that's a generalization, of course. There's some controls. But there's the invisible hand. And that invisible hand is the marketplace, which is the principle of supply and demand. And then in contrast to capitalism, we have socialism. Socialism is an economic system controlled by the government, controlled by a few, central control. And I have been to China, and we see the results of that. I was in China for days and days, mostly in Beijing, but we did take a, a trip up to the Great Wall, a couple hour drive. I never saw one home, not one house. And the whole time I was there, all the traveled all over the Beijing area. I didn't travel all over China, but in that, I never saw a house, not one. Everybody lived in a high rise that I saw. And, and, and there's some wealth, but there's also a, They've been lenient on some things as far as some capitalism. But it's, it's amazing. I, I've, I've been in South Korea, and I see the prosperity of that nation. And I was close to the DMC, and we know what's on the other side. In fact, in China, they said, well, you can, you can own a building. You just can't own the land that it stands on. That doesn't make me very excited about building a building, does it, you? You know, if I can't own the land that somebody can pull the rug out from under, you know. Uh, and so I, I have seen, I do not see this in the Bible. I see that God wants us to give from the heart. But the problem really isn't a system problem. The problem is a sin problem. It is the heart. And in either system, the, uh, there can be greed, even in capitalism, or, and the poor can be explo exploited. And uh, the, the answer is the heart of man. And that's what God wants. He wants my heart. He wants your heart. And he wants us to be like him so that when he does bless us, it's just not, oh, more for me, more for me. It is generous. How can I meet some needs, God? How can I be like you, Jesus? How can I be a giver? It is the heart. In, in England years ago, England, the rich were getting richer and the poor were getting poor. England looked like it was headed for the same kind of a bloody revolution that France had. But John and Charles Wesley were used of God in a mighty way to bring about a revival in England. And the hearts of untold thousands were turned to God. By the way, that revival spilled over in the colonies with the preaching of George Whitfield and others. But it was, it was the heart of man that changed the whole situation there. It wasn't an economic system. It isn't really the system, it is the sin of the heart. 
We are not responsible for making people poor. And if you have been blessed of God, it is hopefully not at the expense of somebody else. You did it because of God's blessing. And we're not, but we are responsible to help the poor because the Bible says that. In fact, caring for the poor is a major theme in the Bible. All through the Bible, it is a major theme. In fact, in Leviticus chapter 19, God said, here's one way I want you to take care of the poor. And these were an agricultural people. Now, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very corners of your field. You shall, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest, nor shall you glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather the fallen fruit of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the needy and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Leave them for, we, when we went through the book of Ruth, I've been through Ruth preaching with you and Steve did it a few months ago. We saw that, uh, that Ruth gleaned in the fields and she was a legitimately poor person because of the tragedy that had happened in their family. And, and this was exactly what God was speaking of. God was concerned about the poor. In the book of Proverbs, God talks so much about the poor. He who is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him. Isn't that amazing? And Proverbs 22, he says, when you give, you will be blessed. And then again in Proverbs 28, um, you will never lack when you give to the poor. And in Proverbs 21, it says it affects our prayer life. If we, if we turn our head from the poor and do not listen, God will not hear us. And so God is concerned about the poor. In fact, in the New Testament, Jesus gave to the poor. And, and in Luke 14, Jesus told us, when you throw a party, when you have a big reception, invite the poor. The cripple, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. For they do not have the means to repay you, but you will be repaid. Did you see that? You will be repaid, God says, at the resurrection of the righteous. Do you know God doesn't always pay off in this life? But there's going to be a great payoff one day. A great payoff. Um, a week ago, I had a, I had a man in our church who knew of a single mom in our ministry who had, uh, had a need and he gave me a hundred dollar bill. He said, pastor, I want you to give this to that mom, give that to that lady. And so, uh, I mean, he just gave me a hundred dollar bill. Oh, wow. And, 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 and so I told Gail, put this in an envelope. She did. And, and I gave it to the lady and I told her it's from me. No, no, I didn't. I, did, I said, this is from someone who asked me to give it to you. I got a text later from her, and she said, because she didn't look at it right away, and she texted me, and she said, I'm on, sitting on my couch wiping away the tears. <laughs> and she shared with me what a, what a blessing it was that somebody would help her like that. And I, I transferred that message to the man who gave it, and he, and he, just, he just sent back a smiley face. There's a joy. You will be repaid, some here, but some there, at the resurrection of the righteous. Oh, the joy of learning to give. All through the New Testament, special offerings for the poor were common in the early church. We see them, and we won't look at these, but in Acts, they were taking offering for people who'd been through difficult things. In 1 Timothy 5, it's about the widows and taking care of the widows in the church. And so, is God concerned? Does God want us to be channels of ves vessels of blessing? Yes, He does. But let me wrap up today by saying, the greatest cause, and by the way, our church helps us scores and scores of people, financially, uh, physically, in many, many different ways. <laughs> uh, but, let me just wrap up by saying the greatest cause, I want you to see this, 
Here's a strange passage. Look at this very unusual passage, Luke 16. Jesus said, I say to you, make friends for yourselves by means of the wealth of unrighteousness, so that when it fails, they will receive you into eternal dwellings. What in the world does that mean? Here's what it means. It means buy people off with your money so you have a lot of friends. No, that's not what it means. It, first reading, it almost looks like that. Does Make friends for yourselves by means of the wealth of unrighteous. That's money. Make friends with people with money. Make friends with, use your money to make friends so that when your money fails, and it will fail, when, when, when you're on your deathbed, you won't be able to buy another day. <laughs> I mean, even if you're a billionaire, you won't be. I mean, when, when your time is up, your money's done, it will fail. But when that happens, if you have used your money to make eternal friends, look at what he says. They will receive you into eternal dwellings. <laughs> In my Father's house are many dwelling places, Jesus said. They will receive you. If you have used your money to make eternal friends, you've helped people come to Jesus by supporting the gospel of Jesus Christ. And people have heard the gospel because of you. When you get to heaven, there's going to be a welcome reception committee for you. And people are going to come up and they're going to say, you know what? You supported the Colliers in Africa. And I heard the gospel because you helped send the Colliers to Africa. You helped send Jason Walbrink to, Ber to Peru. And I heard the gospel because you support it. And people are going to thank you. That's exactly what that verse is saying. Jesus is saying, use your money, your wealth of unrighteousness, to make eternal friends. So that when your money fails, they will welcome you one day into glory. For he is faithful, he, he who is faithful in very little things is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in very little things is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, that's money, who will entrust you true riches? True riches are people. True riches are eternal. God said, be faithful with the unrighteous wealth, and I will give you true riches. Riches that you will have a thousand years from now, 10,000 beyond. That's what he's saying. If you've not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, everything I have right now is another's, it's God's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. That's our Lord. The greatest cause I know of is to help people know Jesus Christ. That's what we're all about, winning people to Jesus Christ, helping people to be ready for eternity. In 1 Corinthians, we have the gospel given to us. For I delivered to you at first importance, number one, first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. This is of first importance. You say, Pastor Carl, should we help people clothe people, feed people? Should we help people pay their rent? Should we help? We do that all the time here, if you want to know the truth. And we help people constantly. With, with temporal needs. But I want to tell you something. There is a far greater need. A far greater need. And we must never lose sight of that. The greatest need anyone ever had is to hear the gospel and to know Jesus. That's the greatest need. The greatest need is not temporal. It is the eternal needs of people. And only the gospel addresses the eternal needs 
of people. And that's why God said to us, and I want to close with this wonderful passage that we've looked at week by week. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. That's the the temple, the local church. So that there may be found in my house, there may be food in my house. Test me now in this. If I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing till it overflows. The only place in the Bible where God says, test me. It's the only place. I, I, I want you to see Aaron and Megan's story about their putting God first. Watch the screen. So my background with giving um, in my growing up years with my parents involved mainly just being generous. Um, they didn't tithe, but they, they did give an offering every week at church, and we went to church weekly, um, but that's mainly how we contributed. My background of giving was from living in a Christian home where we did tithe. So I was raised to give 10% of my income even from a young age. So when we were first married, um, Megan was influential in, in uh, establishing the idea of tithing in our, in our marriage. And through discussions, we decided to, to tithe. And that was really phenomenal to me. And, and we just watched through time as, as I was er- the only earner at that point. I had a job, a starting level job. And it was a lot of money. To, to ride every week to the church and, and uh, it was an interesting time in our lives because we just moved to another state and we had a lot of expenses and whatnot. So we made the decision to give 10% of our income even when it seemed like we didn't have enough to cover all of our bills. And one time we had given our tithe to church and then we received another bill and we honestly had no more money to pay that expense and when we were at church, the pastor gave us a check for $100 that he said someone had given him to give to someone in need. That was pretty remarkable because we were working and had decent jobs, and there was probably someone in church that needed it perhaps more than we did, but God had put it on his heart to give it to us, and that paid our bills. That was really a landmark event in our marriage and in our Christian walk and really established tithing for us. It really showed us that when we were faithful to tithe, God would provide for us. At that point, we started to get concerned about our financial situation, and we had the opportunity to go to a Financial Peace University course hosted at our church. That was really a phenomenal opportunity to learn about finances and re-established I would say the, the, the reasoning behind tithing for me. At that time we were $100,000 in debt and we still chose to tithe during that whole time and God allowed us in four years to pay off that debt and we were able to give to people whose needs came up during that time um, and God still allowed us to pay off the debt. So while we were paying off our debt we came across a situation where a family friend of mine from childhood had two special need children who had some very specific learning issues and they were unable to afford all of the different things that they needed and God put it on our heart to go ahead and buy an iPad along with some learning software so they could make progress in their education and we were blessed to be able to do that and it almost felt like as soon as we made the decision to give that that God allowed us to pay off more debt than we had anticipated being able to. Our goals for the future are to become debt free including our house and that's pretty exciting because that could allow us the opportunity to be generous in even more ways. Wow. That is amazing, isn't it? You didn't even need me to share a message with you today. You heard it right there. That was incredible. I mean, everything I said, they just said. I mean, they were blessed of God when they were in a difficult situation. Their need was met. And then God helped them 
pay off a big debt. And they are pursuing being absolutely 100% debt free, pay off their house. And, and then they were able to be, during that whole, even during that time, they were able to meet the need of somebody else. That is God blessing and making us a blessing. And I'll tell you, that's the excitement. I'm going to ask everyone here today to reach out in front of you and grab that card. Just reach out and grab the card in front of you. Everybody here today is going to do this. Everybody's going to write me a note today because you came on a snow day and you deserve all the credit in the world for coming today. And so I want it recorded. Just, just put your name on that card and say, hi, Pastor Carl, or something like that. <laughs> I don't care what you write, just so it's nice. And, uh, but if God is speaking to you today and you have not made this important step, let me just say to you, I want you to write on your card, I just want you to write tithe-test. I'm taking the test. I'm going to take the step. God said, test me now. I'm going to challenge you to take the test for your sake. To put God first, and I will give God the tithe. Take that important step. Would you do that? Put it on your card. Many of you are already doing this. I'm not asking. Don't, don't put it down if you're already doing this. But if you're new to doing this, and you're saying, God is speaking to my heart. I want to step up. I want to be a tither, then just write tithe-test. You see it on the screen. If you'd write that on your card. Let me just tell you the good news. This is our third and last Sunday to talk to you about this. But I want to tell you, last two Sundays, we have had 70 families write that on their card. Isn't that amazing? God is going to pour out his blessing in an amazing way. I'm so convinced he is. He promised he would. He's going to bless some people in an amazing way. And I, I'm praying for you even by name. That's a lot of names to pray for. But if you will put your name down, if you don't want to put your name down, you don't have to. Or if you just want to put your first name, I don't have to. Nobody's going to contact you. This is between you and God. Absolutely between you and God. But I want to pray for you because you are making a step of faith. And I know you're shifting gears and making a new lifestyle. And it has been a part of my life since I was just a little guy. And my wife and I have been doing this all of our lives. In fact, uh, way beyond this. Uh, but when you do this, God gives you a story to tell, just like Aaron and Megan had there. A story to tell, just like the little widow and the flour and the oil didn't run out. She had a story to tell, just like the little boy who gave his lunch. I, can't, I would have loved to have been at his home when he came home and said, Mama, she said, did you eat your lunch today? <laughs> I just would have loved to have been there when he told Mama, yeah, I ate my lunch and 5,000 other people ate my lunch. <laughs> when you put God first and you get, I'm telling you, you have a story to tell. And it's so exciting. And I want you to have the exciting Christian life. I want your walk with God to be so exciting. And so I'm challenging you today, and I believe that many of you are going to take that important step. I just want to tell you I love you for coming out today. Mitch had to talk me into coming today. I didn't want to come. I texted him after I got stuck outside. I went in, I texted Mitch. I said, Mitch, I can't hardly get out of my drive. It's a mess. He said, uh, well, Pastor, do you, do you really want to cancel? I, no, I don't. I'll be there. <laughs> but I thought it was just going to be me and Mitch. And I told him, I said, well, Mitch, you need this message, so I'll be there. <laughs> Thank you for coming. You are awesome. I love being here, don't you? It is so wonderful to gather around this book. It is so wonderful to be a part of the Calvary family. I love you. I love being your pastor. Thank you, Heavenly Father. It is so awesome to worship you today. I loved our time of worshiping in song. I loved our time gathering around your book. I love this testimony. I love all the things you are doing. And I love these people who have come today. And I know many of them are taking important steps of faith. Putting the world behind them and putting you first. Mm -hmm. Dear God, please bless them in such an amazing way. And help them through the testing times to stand faithful and trust you through it all. 
Lord, keep us safe as we go home. Bless every family here. Thank you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.